All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 84th Online Smetronics Seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Hidekatsu Kribayashi from University College London. He graduated from master's degree of material science at Tohoku University and moved to UK to start his PhD degree course in Cavendish Laboratory at University of Cambridge. He was awarded a PhD in physics in 2010 and continued his academic career on prestigious fellowships such as Darwin College Research Fellow, JSPS Postdoctoral Fellow, and JST Fellowship, which he brought into University College London to start his own research group in 2013. He's now a full professor of condensed metaphysics and nanoelectronics in the London Center for Nanotechnology at UCL. So without further ado, Professor Kribayashi, please uh, uh, go ahead with the talk. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction, Sin, and thank you very much for you know, this lovely invitation to contribute to your wonderful seminar series. Um, so I, my name is Hide Kribayashi and uh, from London. And uh, today I'm very excited about uh, introducing our latest result on, you know, like 2D materials, spin systems, and then we try to control magnetism and also spin dynamics by kind of changing the carrier density by uh, with different ways. So this uh, research has been uh, done by a collaboration between UCL, that's my institute, and also NUS, National University of Singapore. And the particular mention goes to Ivan, Saif, and Christoph. They did an absolutely fantastic job to push this project forward. And also, I just want to mention that Gokier, that he's um, uh, my collaborator and friend uh, from NUS. Okay, well, let's get started. So I just give you some, some brief overview of what I'm gonna talk in the next 45 minutes. Um, I start with uh, some introduction of 2D bundle world system, magnetic system, why do we care? And what's like my view of why, why we should work on this and followed by um, three different topics mainly for the first two topics, but this is just control the magnetism, particular um, to the van der Waals magnet uh, by electrostatic gating such as this, and also some chemical doping, just put some uh, element between this van der Waals gap, and that can create some carriers. And then from that, we can control the magnetic property of this particular materials. And if time permit, I'm going to uh, show you our latest result of coupling of the CDT, we call it CDT um, uh, in this talk, um, the CDT and uh, magnet, and also photon accumulated in this resonator. This is a resonator made out of superconducting magnet, the so super, <laughs> superconducting materials. All right, so let's get started. Um, so I just wanna give you some flavor of what is a 2D van der Waals materials. So this is just a nice schematic from, 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 from Maguire, Maguire in, in Oak Ridge. And this is just a simply just so you have a layered material such as graphene, it looks like a graphene. The key difference is that it has a, a, a spin in the localized moment. And we can do so by just having uh, some, for example, transition materials such as chromium and if the, Ionic state is like three plus, and there is some um, crystalline or ligand field involved. It can create some upspin populated into one of the uh, subband, T2G band. And then because of the front row, you can you know, polarize about three mu B um, magnetic moment per uh, atoms. <clears throat> so that, that's the thing. So that's the gradient to create a magnetic order if we put it in dense. And also they have a reasonably strong exchange coupling between. Right, so before heading to that, that, that main context, I just want to give you more uh, background of 2D materials itself. What I like about 2D materials is that normally from the spintronics background, a sample growth technique could be like a, a sputtering or MBE if you want to grow really high quality or a single crystal materials, um, then that's, basically characterized by the physical vapor deposition. I just highlight vapor as italic because during this process, 
essentially you just disassemble everything into the atom or dimer or molecules, and then just put it in the substrate and then let them you know, form uh, some materials on the substrate. During that process, uh, what, we, what, what dominates this process is normally thermodynamics on the substrate or surface, and also some kinetics within a sort of time scale. And that's one thing. Uh, by contrast, what we can introduce as a 2D material fabrication is that uh, we don't disassemble everything into like uh, atoms or dimer. What we do is just maintain the layer for each layers, each, each materials, and then put them together. So what we can say, uh, uh, difference between these two, is that because we maintain almost a thermodynamically stable layer and as a building block, we can put a uh, lots of different materials on top of each other. And that doesn't govern, it's not governed by uh, some dynamics or kinetic as it, it were in the some this particular growth technique. And also if you want to grow really single crystal and architecture growth, maybe in this technique you have to be worried about or that is matching, strain and so on. But that that concern just goes away when we rely on this mechanical exfoliation. And also a similar uh, related to this, therefore we can just put lots of, lots of different materials on top of each other to create really artificial um, materials uh, by yourself. And um, just to, also, I just want to mention particular things, not only just, uh, you know, putting the materials stuck to each other, uh, we can also control the rotation and then I don't have to go into I don't go to into very detail, but that's the one of the really uh, hot topics of, of these materials, for example, like magic gun with graphene <coughs> related to correlation, electron correlation. Right. Okay. So then more towards the spintronics uh, argument. So I, I think everybody can uh, is happy to agree that spintronics effect is driven by mostly like interfacial effects, like such as GMO, you know, spin driven DMI or Rashiva effect, for example, there are many, many others. And uh, if you want to just make it like a really small, like single few more layer devices, typically we can enhance this surface dropping effect uh, into more, you know, effective. So that, that's just uh, some, of the, some of the hypothesis I, I feel and a bit more device application like, um, if you like, then what I can argue is that um, here I just some cartoon of this MRAM like, like devices on top of this line and uh, made out of say underworld's uh, systems. And if you try to see the switching character of this, this is just a switching current required to switch it, like one a, a, a moment into the up spin to down spin that is based on the macro spin. Uh, what we can notice is that this um, uh, within the numerator, we, we have a kind of the parameter depends on the magnetic volume. So if you reduce the thickness as soon as possible down to like a single monolayer, this thickness goes down. And typically this Van der Waals system, we don't have a huge magnetic moment so that we can kind of reduce this parameter as low as possible uh, while maintaining this magnitude of 2D limit. So that's one thing that probably we can benefit from this materials group. And also looking at the denominator, what we can tell you is that um, this is the efficiency of the creating a spin or effective magnetic field by the current. And the uh, question is whether this materials group can be useful for this. And we don't know that's why we're going to do the experiment, but it, we believe that it, it's got some potential to, to show an interesting future. I just want to tell it, uh, show this table as some expected symmetry of spin what will be filled in this 2D materials, this 2D materials, and then just we add the polar symmetry because when you go down to a very a, a small thickness and on the substrate, for example, and at the side of different materials, we can create a polar symmetry in, in these materials, and then that can produce additional spin orbit effect. So just to highlighting uh, one of the sample, I just was so one of the materials, just what, what I can tell you is that typically if you create polar materials, then what we can expect a simple Rashiba spin will be filled. So this the field is 
perpendicular to the current direction J and also the outer plane A in effect of Z. But not only just this, this component within this material, because of this trigonal symmetry or three four symmetry in, in plane, then what we can tell you is that not only just uh, this, this, this term, we can create an effective magnetic field parallel to the current. That primarily due to um, a discretional structure. And the 2D material itself, it's, it's basically symmetry is low compared to the cubic material that we normally working on the spintronics. So there is some interesting character that we can explore uh, for the spin orbit uh, uh, physics. Right, so this is just uh, some catalog of um, 2D materials or 2D magnetic materials reported and explored. I don't want to go into detail again, but just what I can highlight is that uh, all of the material can go down to the pulmonary regime and sustain the magnetic order so that we can do like dating effect or check checking the magnetic property as a function of like a layer number and so on. So that it's a really exciting topic to work on. Right, so this is the background. And then now I'm going to move on to our particular experiment carried out. And the first topic is this electric static control of CGT magnetism. So the motivation here is that um, if you open the you know, textbook of magnetism, uh, you can read that there are different type of exchange interactions. For example, um, if two atoms, so two moments are exchanging upward through some third ions, which is non-magnetic, we can still maintain some strong exchange coupling, and that, that's called a super exchange coupling. And also so some carriers can mediate some exchange coupling as well. So that's called double exchange or RKKY uh, interactions. And then finally, this is probably more a uh, popular or common. Um, and if, if the um, in the metallic regime, we can go into the itinerant, therefore, there is a direct section between uh, uh, two different uh, magnetic ions. Um, so that, that, that's the different type of action coupling. And you can just as easily understand that that carrier density or conductivity property is different for the different uh, doping density regime. Right, so the question here is that can we control this action coupling regime? Because there's this really significant development about controlling magnetic moment or rotation of magnetism using a diluted magnetic semiconductor and also ultrasync film of like ferromagnetic metals. And these two are more or less like on the metallic regime. This is more like more like 10 to 18 cubic per centimeter carrier density normally to, uh, to achieve this kind of ferromagnetism. And also metal is metal. So I don't see any significant development about how to control this, um, for example, magnetism from exchange, super exchange interaction to double exchange. So we can do so by picking up some of the 2D materials to check whether that's possible or not. So that's the naive motivation that we set out earlier. Right, so the controlling manner is just doping, either electrostatic gating or chemical doping. And then we just try to control some magnetic properties such as Curie temperature, and this is related but just exchange interaction mechanism, and also like magnetic anisotropy uh, energy. Right, so then the material that we are uh, working on is a still called like chromium germ interferite, just already named at CDT in this talk. And just a fresher, this is a band structure, created band structure. This is like a narrow band semiconductor. And uh, once you uh, go cooling down and then just uh, resistance goes up significantly. And then at the same time, we create some sort of long range magnetic order. And the exchange coupling is it's through this tellurium eh? and the chromium obviously has got some magnetic moment. And then easy axis of the bulk material is out of play. So that, that's the things that we, whether we can control or not, that's the question here. Right, so then I just want to acknowledge some audio work. So this is, for example, one et al reported that this, we cannot see, but this is a CGT on, on here. 
And by using the silicon oxide solid state gating or capacitor, then we can just uh, apply a electric field to try to control the carrier density and measure uh, magnetic property by the magnet optical manner. You can see that, so you can see by applying uh, a gate voltage from, I think, zero to minus 100, you can see the subtle change of this uh, hysteresis measured by the uh, car rotation. And they plot, I think, this scale of the size of the magnetic, you know, this car rotation angle as a function of this gating voltage. You can see that some change of this moment here, both in the hole and electron doping regime. And what we can highlight is this, this is carrier density control. It's about a board of 10 to 12 a square, a square a centimeter. And at the same time, we were working on this and then we know, we know that our gating is much more you know, aggressive. We achieved 10 to, 4, to 14 square centimeter. And the question here is whether we can change more than like qualitatively different from this and the ours. So that's a question. Right, so before just showing you some of the uh, results, I can just uh, wanted to show you how to fabricate the material or like a device, I would say. So this is our like uh, recently installed um, grow box. And inside of this grow box, we have a, like a microscope, shall we say, and also some transfer stage inside. So here I, my student, uh, Zekin is, and doing, let me try to show you <clears throat> this one. Um, so you're just uh, doing some scotch tape technique, trying to make the um, initial break uh, thinner so that we can uh, make uh, some devices. So that's what he's doing inside of the grow box. Now, um, another student, Charlie, is trying to um, uh, look at the micro here and they're having this, uh, um, a TV game controller because he's bored. In fact, he's not bored, but he's doing is um, he's uh, looking at, he's trying to control this uh, alignment of this um, and XYZ stage and the rotation by using that uh, TV controller, TV game controller. And I'm going to show you some of the uh, uh, real action here. Um, I just skipped some of these. You can see that there's the, the a flag that we're interested in and they're trying to transfer. Uh, this fake on top of this uh, pre patterned uh, electrode. So, this is something that we were working on. And if you're doing a good job, so you can make some nice fake. And then, in this particular case, we patterned the electrode on top of it, but um, that's the device what we are doing. And this particular device, uh, actually, this is made in Singapore, I should say that. But um, and the thickness of the CDT is 20 nanometer, not um, like a few monolayer regime. So, and then putting like an ionic gel and then just uh, trying to apply the electric field. Now, so this is the uh, gate source current. This is the gate source, source to rain current, source to rain current, and that has a function of gate voltage. You can see that when you increase the positive uh, uh, electric field, or the positive voltage, you can increase the conductivity really in acutely, but then if you go down to a uh, negative side, this is a hodl regime, it sounds like the behavior is, is not as we wished. So there's some chemical reaction possibly happening, therefore we stick to this positive voltage side, in other words, electron dope regime. Now, on top of it, I just would like to highlight is that when we apply the large electric field, what has happened was that um, because so much um, accumulation happening within the really surface, then we notice that effective transport uh, thickness is in fact, uh, um, in fact uh, as, as small as one nanometer. This is defined by how much you can induce in the carrier doping, but we realize that although we started 20 nanometer, we uh, effectively apply large electric field, we achieve quasi two dimensional you know, uh, transport uh, two-dimensional electron uh, system, potentially with magnets. So that's uh, interesting to highlight. So this is the resistance as a function of temperature, just uh, a double checking. So if you don't 
gate anything, then what's going to happen is this temperature dependence, like a semiconductor behavior or insulating behavior. Now, when you apply voltage large enough, then what's going to happen is temperature dependence is now more like metallic. From that, we are very happy to see this. And then when we just measure RxY to characterize the um, carrier density, then we calculate that at the highest uh, voltage regime, we achieve 10 to 14 square a centimeter. So that's great. That's exactly what we wanted to do. Now, uh, moving on. So now we are confident that we achieve really high um, uh, carrier density injections. Now we move on to um, magnetic resistance. Therefore, we apply a magnetic field and measure on XX. So uh, the, I just want to show you just a one by one, but um, if you look at the 60 Kelvin, so we do have some hysteresis in the on XX. It's a bit really jumpy, but what we can tell you is that this is just pretty much signature of magnetism. Now you just jump to like 120 Kelvin, although bulk Q temperature is 64 Kelvin, uh, we still observed a you know like clear hysteresis behavior when we sweep the magnetic field up and down, by the way, along the perpendicular direction. Now, now uh, if you just follow the increase, then you can still maintain it, just go on and go on. So um, that, that's Pretty much like um, we increased the Curie temperature really uh, high. And what we're trying to characterize is now how to you know, characterize the magnetism uh, or Curie temperature based on these kind of transport measurement. And then before just moving on that point, uh, we also rotate the magnetic field out of plane into the in plane. So this is pretty much more or less like out of plane regime. And then we just uh, rotate it just about 10 degrees in plane. So this is 80 degrees to away from the in plane. You can still see that this history is really shrink down to the small magnetic field regime. And then just things goes on. And then finally, just zero a field, uh, sorry, zero angle that represents the in plane orientation. We can see the switching is really happening in a very, very small magnetic field region. So when we plot this, uh, uh, switching event, completion of speed switching event as a saturate of you know, switching HSAT and other function of the magnetic field angle, gamma, gamma is defined by this. And you can see that this is really peaky behavior as we observed here. So that behavior is different from what we expect from the single domain uh, switching, i.e. Snow Wolfos model. It is obvious because our device is it's not the single domain pretty much. The size of the lateral side is probably something like um, a few micrometer at least. Therefore, it is obviously an appropriate to use more like a domain wall model uh, characterized by this Kondorsky model. So this is very, very simple a uh, domain wall model, but instead of like a, a switching saturation field is just recover in an easy to hard axis, but this, this, this particular case, saturation field is, is going down really rapidly as a manner of one over cosine a gamma system. So it's a nice matching to the things that, nice confirmation that uh, you know, our case is really fitting or matching to this uh, old model as well. Right, so then this is the summary of this HU. HU is a different of the switching uh, field for both between in plane and out of plane. So what we can quickly notice, by the way, just what we can quickly notice is that now um, out of plane is a hard axis. That is stark different from this uh, um, bulk system. As I mentioned, bulk system out of plane is easy axis, but now when you do, even just as well as 2.6 volt using 2.6 volt, it's actually switched to the imprint favored materials. And then as you increase voltage more and more, it seems like this anisotopy goes up because this body goes up. And also um, this uh, Curie temperature increases because we can characterize naively Curie temperature as this, this body goes to zero. 
And this is a function of the gate voltage here. So they can see that QE temperature goes up like this. Okay, so just a, just a quick demonstration. If, if you just maintain the, your device as a 170 Kelvin, and then, then just uh, if you apply 3.1 volt, then you don't see anything. But if you do the same process, but starting from 3.9 volt, you can see that you can uh, create a magnetism. Although this is a bit cheeky because uh, if you use a, a ionic gel and we cannot uh, uh, change the voltage at this um, temperature uh, because this, this gel is frozen um, at this temperature. We have to warm up and cool down, but this is some, some sort of like nice demonstration to show that a magnetism can be controlled by the electric field. All right, some of the interpretation. Um, so as I explained, so in, in the undoped regime, the band structure looks like this, and we have a gap, therefore, some, some gap between here, and then just the uh, chromium three plus moment couples to another three plus moment by the room. And that can be just uh, in the motor, we can just hypothesize that the electron is just virtually excited and hopping around. And if you just think about this and then think about kinetic energy of these things, then we can reduce by, by polarizing in the same direction and that we can reduce the total uh, uh, free energy. So that, that's the kind of basic understanding of this super exchange mechanism. Now, if you do, what's going to happen is our calibration tells us that a, a one in a four chromium, about 25%, uh, becomes a, a two plus. Now starting with three plus, now a, a 25%, roughly 25% of chromium has got more electron, and then we have to operate that electron in a conduction band. So unlike this, this electron can easily hop around more freely because this is already there, and that gives you stronger exchange coupling because the bond is much stronger. The transfer uh, uh, probability is much stronger. So that's that we believe the driving force of this increase of QE temperature in our experiment. And uh, we ask the theorists to kind of create the, um, um, some, some energy uh, with, with the EFT calculation. So this is just a result I want to share with you. Um, so by checking the J exchange interaction strengths, what we can do is basically just compare the free energy of the antiferromagnetic order CGT by just changing the moment direction by hand and the conic rate of free energy and compare that value as the ferromagnetically ordered uh, CGT crystals. And that difference is proportional to the J exchange. So that, that's one parameter to look into in, in the ADFT calculation. And it nice we see that that Parameter can depend on the carrier density, and that increases when we increase the carrier density. So that's a nice uh, qualitative match or semi quantitative matching between the theory and the experiment. And also, what we can do in, 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 in the ther theory calculation, DFT calculation, is that now we just put the magnetic moment of the CGT. Now, this is a both, both ferro, say, out of plane, and then when, when we then calculate the, the energy, and then do the same thing when you polarize the magnetic moment in plane, and then subtract this, this two different uh, energy scale. Obviously, this energy scale is subtle, smaller. This energy scale is higher because it's exchange, but this is more or less like spin wall bed. Therefore, uh, it's almost a few meter electron volt regime. But what we can see here is that when we do a lot, now the sign of this, uh, you know, Uniaxial and isotropy out of plane in plane is changes from uh, neg positive to negative. So that's again, that's a nice matching between uh, our experimental observation. So that, that's that. Then we can just move on to the similar experiment, but not electric static dating, but just using the chemical doping method. Now, the reason why I just we, we started to work on this is because we, when we do the experiment uh, in the electrostatic dating, what we uh, noticed was not only just uh, creating carrier doping, but also electric field as you know, electric field inside of the materials 
And also as a result, we create a 2D confinement in the materials as well, which is nice, but uh, we don't know uh, out of three what, create, what creates the um, um, uh, effect that we observed um, cleanly. So whereas when we do integrate, we call it integration basic element or in, inside of the Van der Waals gap, then we, we are not so worried about uh, these two uh, effects because this doesn't create electric field and 2D confinement. So this is a bulk sample, and we can only focus on the, but we can tell that the effect of integration or carry doping is really, uh, really there, and then see what these does, these do for the magnetic properties. So that's the motivation of, of our experiment. Right, so then just jumping on the results. So now we put the um, um, sodium into, um, uh, uh, these CDT. Now, what, what's going to happen is that now we see that um, in the undorped regime again, there's a nice shooting of this insulating behavior. When we do, we didn't achieve the metallic properties, but still uh, sizable difference between doped and undorped materials. And then what we can quickly notice when we measure the RXX component, so this is the magnetic resistance in the, when we apply the magnetic field out the plane we don't observe any more um, the jumpy behavior. The transition seems very smooth compared to the one that we observed in uh, um, electrostatic gating experiment. Now, we, for example, we, well, we can plot this, this peak height, central peak height as a function of temperature, as a potential signature of the magnetism. When we do that, this can sustain down to almost like a, 200 Kelvin, and that's, in, that's kind of you know, similar to what we observe in the electrostatic gating experiment. But the question remains whether this is really coming from the AMR or something else. Therefore, uh, we do other experiment later I will show you, that is the FMR experiment, to confirm that this is indeed something to do with the um, a ferromagnetic order. Uh, before doing that, um, I'm going to also show you some additional experiment. So this is an experiment where we apply the magnetic field out of the plane and rotate into the in-plane. So what we can notice is the shape is very similar, but this saturation point is different. So what we can tell you is that when we apply the out of plane experiment, this is the outer a, a curve, we need more magnetic field to saturate. That's the uh, character of the hard axis. When we do the same experiment, let's think about the in plane, this is a purple plot, then we can tell you that uh, this requires less magnetic field to saturate. Therefore, we can tell that it seems like in plane is an easy axis. Again, this is in agreement with our experiment in electrostatic measurement. Right, so then we can compare uh, side by side. What we can tell you is that it seems like Curie temperature is both enhanced, therefore carrier doping does uh, Curie temperature enhancement, as well as uh, easy access switching between out of plane to in plane, because we observe this switching in both measurement. Uh, difference is that, as you can see, the shape of the, um, on XX is very different between these two. So we don't know exactly what's happening there, but that's definitely coming from the fact that this is more like 2D confined or really, really like surface effect or interface effect. So that's as much as I can tell at this moment, um, but uh, we are working on further to understand uh, this effect. So two, Characterize this chemically built materials, we also did an FMR experiment because now uh, we have a bulk sample, therefore it's a sizable volume. Therefore, when we put these materials on top of such as on chip waveguide, then we can observe um, energy absorption when magnet is resonating. So just a quick fresher for somebody who is not working on the FMR. So this, this, this is a frequency as a function of this a magnetic field. In this particular experiment, we apply the magnetic field in plane. And this is the plot for the undoped CGT. 
So what's happening here is that um, uh, we have some like Archie behavior for the small magnetic field region, and then there are some dip, and then finally it's followed by some more like a positive slope behavior. So what's happening here is that assuming, or we know that it is the case, but um, this is out plane favored materials because this is undoped CGT. Then we apply the magnetic field in plane. The moment want to try to stay on out the plane region. Therefore, when within this small magnetic field region, this external magnetic field and magnetic moment is, is not a collinear. Then we try to push this moment in plane. In other words, the magnetic energy goes down when we go increase the magnetic field until this one goes down fully. But in, in normally in an experiment, we cannot close any magnetic gap anymore down to zero. Uh, but it stays somewhere because this, this is pretty much because of the multi-domain behavior. Then just to recover here, at this regime, magnetic moment and external magnetic field is calling here because this magnetic, sorry, magnetic field is canceled to the ex, in, intrinsic out of plane in the actual isotropy. So mathematically, mathematically, it can be characterized as a simple term. And then if this external magnetic field cancel to uniaxial and sort of out of plane, this is the region that this should go down to zero in the macroscopic model, macro spin model. So that's the out of plane favored magnetic field behavior, magnetic material behavior. Now I'm gonna show you that when we do this uh, materials by uh, some materials that can create a carrier. So instead of some anti behavior here, what we can tell you is that that curve goes down to almost the origin. So this is the typical um, easy axis behavior. I just wanna keep mentioned that this is a case where we apply the magnetic field in plane. So that means that from by looking uh, this behavior, we can guarantee that this is the in plane you know, favors materials. So we can see that. So we have some, some extra spin wave resonance, which we don't have any idea how to explain it, but it's this interesting behavior um, to be added. So then I just wanna show you some temperature dependence. So if we can still see this behavior up to 240 Kelvin. And if you go up to 250 Kelvin, this disappears. So we can see still, we can see nice keto fit. And also just as a proof that you see, in playing an out brain rotation measurement, we can see that uh, the fact that we have a Require the high magnetic field to see the resonance for the outer plane, which means that this is in plane favor material. Right, so then I can show you our latest result. If you don't know what's going to happen, we can sustain this magnetic resonance at the room temperature more or less. But I just, this is probably just, again, okay, mention that although we can observe this one, this might be field polarized uh, per magnetic order, because if you look at the effective, you know, a magnetization in the fit, then it comes down like this uh, uh, rapidly, but this is uh, floating on, on this, uh, uh, some values, and still we observe this one, but this, this behavior doesn't change with temperature. This doesn't match to the typical uh, magnetic moment as a function of temperature and acute temperature. So that, that's the things that I want to mention. Right, so I have maybe a few minutes to uh, uh, wrap up. And uh, before that, I just want to show you our latest results of this magnum photon coupling uh, using CDT Frake. Now, this is a go back to the Frake. We made a superconductive resonator and it put some, it's a bit dirty, but we put that like a Frake and then see whether we can couple this resonating photons and magnum in, on this chip. Right, only just these three results. I, I don't want to go into very details, but I just want to flash you some uh, uh, our latest results. So this is the resonator uh, on, the opti on the optical microscope. This is a schematic that I can say that we made a bunch of things on the uh, chip. And then if you put this chip uh, uh, on the waveguide, and then we can make this resonator like, like, like this peak, with this peak. And I can say that with the CDT on top, uh, this, this is what we call loaded Q factor, quality factor means how much this photon can leave within this um, resonator, then this can achieve reasonably good number of 6,000. 
So that's the a, a character of our resonator. Now uh, I can give you some core results only. Um, this is uh, some core results. So this is the frequency of the function of the magnetic field in 2D map uh, when we measure uh, this, uh, this 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 uh, board by RBNA. Right, so then what I can tell you is this, this I start with this uh, Carly behavior, that's because our superconducting resonator has a subtle magnetic field dependence because that's superconductor. Then uh, what we can see, quickly notice is that this region uh, peak becomes very subtle or in other words, dumped heavily. So what's happening here is that I just wanna explain this behavior of my, this uh, just quick schematics. So we, in this region, let's start with here. So you just put the photon in the resonator and ha that's a happy living, you know, as a Q factor of like 6,000. And then this has a specific uh, dumping character. Let's say this is kappa, kappa zero. Now, when we sweep the magnetic field, you just uh, slightly detriment this resonator. But at some point you just hit some point where we know that this is the, a, 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 this is a point where uh, spin waves or magnons of the CDT uh, resonate. So in this point, what's gonna happen is that now you just uh, efficiently create the CDT uh, through the resonator and they couples. And that's normally characterized as a coupling parameter G. Uh, uh, and then things here is that this dumping of this uh, uh, magnon is actually worse or quicker than this dumping of the resonator. In fact, Q factor is very, very weak. You don't normally call, use the Q factor, but just uh, it's quickly decay. Then that's the reason why this, this is very, um, you know, we peak is rather weak and we don't see anymore. But what we can do is just every single magnetic field, we just uh, have a, this photon mode peak, and then just we perform the Lorentz fit. And this plot is the line list of this Lorentz fit. So this region, what we can tell you is that this uh, effective uh, line width is almost constant as a function of the magnetic field. But as soon as you hit that, it just shoots up because now they talk to each other and then the, all, most of the energy is dumped through this uh, a magnon channel. Before that, this, that, this channel doesn't exist because G is very, very weak. Uh, therefore, well, G is there, but the, this, this, this is the uh, efficiency of the magnetic excitation is weak. Therefore, this dumping is going through this channel. There is some, some uh, uh, knowledge of fit and so on, but we just have to leave it uh, for, for uh, our manuscript. Right, so I, I forgot to mention, but this is 30 nanometer CDT. We can also do the same experiment this 10 nanometer CDT. We can still, this is very subtle anymore. Subtle, but um, we can steal some peaks so that we can see a nice observation. I should mention that uh, it really depends on the device to device. We can still, you know, this sometimes like 30 nanometer uh, coupling is very, very strong or very, very weak. So it really depends on the resonator and individual flake that you transfer onto. But at least what I can tell you is that the peak is really present at 10 nanometer. And then what we are trying to do is really do the same experiment in a truly cumulative human, regime. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, and I just wanna stop, move on to the summary slide. So uh, for the first part, I just try to, we just try to adorb this material CDT uh, um, with, with either electrostatic dating or chemical doping. And then we achieve to make it conductive at the level of 10 to 14, at least for the case of electrostatic dating. Uh, with that, uh, we achieved the Curie temperature enhancement. Probably most likely that the activation of different uh, exchange interaction and also clear switching of the magnetic easy axis from out of plane to in plane. So the second part is very brief and quick, but I just, what I can mentioned that it is possible to electromagnetically couple uh, your resonator into the CDT flake. And that would be the, hopefully like a building block of the further experiment, the more spintronics experiment, or just prove of the 2D a, a magnetic dynamics. 
or to magnetic dynamics in a 2D limit. Now, finally, I just want to remark that uh, this is just really tips in the iceberg. There are lots of lots of exciting experiments in this uh, research domain. And, but yet, there are so many you know, open questions. I, I explore the questions in this research field. Hope that we really push this um, field as an international collaborative entity, and then we find really exciting physics or technology there. With that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I pass this over to uh, Shin. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. And we can thank the speaker using the reaction button. Uh, at this moment, uh, this talk is open for questions. If you have any questions on Zoom, please use the raise hand function that you can find also on the reactions. And if you're watching this on Twitch, please just type your question in the chat box and I'll read it for you. Okay, do we have any question here? Uh, oh, Alex, please uh, go ahead with your question. Um, uh, so, I, oh, my camera. Uh, so I have a question. So uh, when it's in plane, so do you still expect long range order in this uh, uh, layered structure? Uh, when Are you talking about magnetic in, long range order? Yes, but when it becomes um, in plane. Um, I believe that everything that we show is the proof of long range magnetic order because that's just evidence of the magnetism. But that's evidenced by the magnetic magnetism or different magnetic um, properties. Hmm. Does that make sense? So, yeah, because th there is this Norman Wagner theorem and uh, but the, maybe because it's layer structure, it becomes kind of uh, quasi 3D. So that, that's what my question is related to. Okay, 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 right. So yes, I just mentioned a little bit about this uh, a Malmi Morgana theorem. So that, that's a very, very beautiful theory, but then that's only applicable to uh, um, ice, a isotropic magnet, meaning that if anisotropy is zero. So in reality, what you do is when you make a you know, magnet, any form, then you have a crystal or you have any dimensional effect, then it, it is inevitable to have a, you know, always there is a magnetic anisotropy. As soon as you create that, you create a magnum gap. Therefore, it is very difficult to apply this uh, theory anymore. Uh, all right, I see, thank you. Great, do you have another question? Uh, Barry, please uh, go ahead with a question. Yeah, thanks very much for a very nice talk. I wondered, uh, you know, these are relatively thick uh, flakes that you're looking at. And I'm wondered if, uh, any of this could be attributed to a change in the plane spacing in the structure and whether you've addressed that uh, from a theoretical standpoint, that is just very uh, the spacing in the van der Waals structure to determine whether or not, you know, the exchange energies changed. Uh, maybe the exchange energies are dominated entirely by in plane exchange, but uh, I would think there would be some, com some component from the planar spacing. Uh, so theory should be able to speak to that, or have you looked at anything like the Raman breathing modes as you're doing, you know, applying these electrostatic fields? Right. Okay. So what, yeah. gel I... or by intercalation, particularly, I think that would be uh, right. Really okay. interesting. Yes. Um, so this is a Raman measurement for. Um, electric fielding action. So well, maybe I we, missed this. I didn't see this slide. Okay. Yeah, so sorry. This is, sorry, I didn't put in the main slide because I'm a bit worried about running on my time. But I, <laughs> I, I left this for, for the question one. Okay. Sorry, just, so now I can just walk you through. So this is like a measurement, three different measurements. Number one, uh, uh, zero, before applying electric field, this is a point here. 
and then I just we just bring on to this electric field up to electric voltage for both and the measure that Raman yeah. and then it's coming back to green region. So it's just complete one cycle and then measure each point. Now what we can tell you is that uh, pretty much uh, like this a, a vibration mode stay the same. When you do that, I'm not the expert Raman, I have to say, but there is a, some broadening and things that's because of the presence of the conduction electron, as, according to my colleague. But if you go back, then this is remain the same. From that, what we can tell you is that pretty much we maintain the same crystalline structure and uh, you know, this vibration mode, it, it's pretty much the same. So that's as much as I can tell you. And for the Raman for intercalation, we do have the data. We don't have the data on this slide, but I can guarantee you that we, 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 this peak position, they don't change significantly with doping. The, um, so, yeah. So that means so, that we maintain like a framework the same, but now yeah, you can say- The modes you're showing, if the, the labeling is typical or consistent with TMDs are modes which correspond to vibrations within the layer, right? And these don't reflect interactions between the layers. So okay, the breathing, yeah. I'm not a Raman expert either. So, you know, you should take what I say with a grain of salt. Uh, but the much low energy modes would reflect changes in layer spacing, for example. So what yeah. you show here, you know, between the green and the blue curves just says, you know, nothing changes when you run it through a voltage cycle. And, and that's very reassuring. Uh, it, it, the red curve, you know, suggests that something is changing. Uh, with applied field, and it's something that's structural. At least that's the way I would look at this, with the caveat that I'm not a Raman expert. <laughs> so I would be looking, what I'm looking for is whether or not there are other contributions to the changes in magnetic properties that you're seeing, which derive from a physical change in bond length, layer spacing, twist angle, something like that rather than entirely a carrier density argument, or that might be concomitant with a change in carrier density. So that, that was my general question. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I, I think, I, I think uh, that, theory that, could do this pretty easily. Yeah, so, so yeah, you're right. You answered your question by yourself. So if you just, uh, I don't know, I just move it to my side very uh, quickly. So the theory can sort of, so this is a theory result and I, so what they did is just, I believe that, yeah, I have to, you know, I have to double check, but um, they made the same, uh, you know, CDT crystal. And what they did is just adding more carrier and then stabilize the crystal and so on and so forth. There might be a subtle change of the bonding length or interlayer coupling different lengths and so on. I didn't ask them to scrutinize. But then it seems like the fact that they didn't raise this problem, uh, for example, they couldn't stabilize this uh, lattice when you do this order, mm -hmm. meaning that um, I think this contribution should be um, not as significant as we explain these results. So that's as much as I can tell. Okay. But uh, the, I agree that there, but this is a fair point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, AMR hysteresis curves that you showed. So it looked like at low temperatures, there was a lot of structure to them. I was wondering if there's something interesting to it. Yeah, here. And it, it doesn't look random because when you go in the positive direction and the negative direction, they almost look like exact mirrors yeah, of each absolutely. other. Yeah, absolutely. So we spend, uh, I don't know, pretty much one, one year to explain. So normally what, you, what, what we hoped was, um, you know, using this, uh, you know, magnetic resistance or AMR trees, it, it, you can simply just model between the angle of the magnetic moment and the current. And we try to fit that as much as we can, but as you can see, this is like, a, sometimes it changes sign as well. So, it's, it's very difficult um, to explain the individual switching event. This is definitely not uh, smooth, as you can see, 
it's almost like, uh, you know, like, like a creaking something, more like a domain wall motion or something. But um, it is very, very difficult to um, analyze, I have to say. H however, as you can see, these behavior are really reproducible. So if, if somebody can explain it and then tell me how to do it, it it's um, fantastic. I think that's one of the motivation that I just throw this open question to the community and then some clever people can really you know, make some model or at least some point us to some direction. Mm -hmm. So also, this is not a question, but I just want to mention that side of this AMR, not, not AMR, I shouldn't call it, the magnet resistance is large. So this is already normalized. But this is almost like a 10%. So that's uh, very different from what you, the value that you expect on them. For example, like a transition metal ferromagnet, which is more like a 0.1% order. Then I can, I can show you, let me just try to show you. Again, this is a slide for the question. So this, we do rotate the magnetic field out of plane and in plane. You can see in plane is like almost like a 0.1%. This is almost matching to uh, what we expect for the just typical AMR body. But when you do the same thing out of plane, not only just the big size, but also the shape is different. Initially I thought, oh, hang on a second, this is a hard axis, so that's why this is peaky. But this value, one tesla, is already you know, enough to fully saturate the magnetic moment against the you know, anisotropy. So again, this doesn't make sense. And then when you increase the magnetic moment, so magnetic field size to five tesla, nine tesla, you know, you can make it more, you know, make it smoother, but also the size is different. Again, this is a, a big open question, and I just, I'm happy to disclose these data to the community and listen what people say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, do we have any other question? Uh, if not, we'll have another discussion session right after this. But at this moment, we're just going to stop the live streaming and the recording. I want to thank the speaker one more time for giving us a very inspiring talk.